Amen. Can you put your hands together and celebrate the Elevation Priest of Praise, the band, the musicians, for just reminding us again, every day it gets better. Every day it gets stronger. Every day I fall in love with Jesus. You know, there are things, there are things that you think about, you consider doing, and they always seem too hard, too big, too strong. But there's a place you can walk with God in, love God with, grow in loving God with, that things that seemed so hard yesterday just become. When I got born again years ago, I remember that some of the things that looked like strong concerns for me, like, Bola, how will you do this? You know, I, I, I couldn't deny that the message of Jesus was compelling too compelling for me not to give my life to Jesus. But I wondered, how, how will you cope with, you know, just living a life that pleases God? And I think the most significant thing that I can look back on these decades past is to say that it gets better. Just walking with God. Just, just holding his hand. Letting the Holy Spirit walk you through. You know, what it means to really fall in love with Jesus every day, every moment. And I pray today that someone in this room, every day will be a better, brighter, sweeter experience walking with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Once again, can you put your hands together and just celebrate? Celebrate this amazing. You know, they've preached the first sermon in this service, right? Or maybe the second or third, really, depending on what you're counting. But that was a powerful, powerful message for someone. Amen. Amen. You know, as I was preparing and thinking about the service, you know, I had a strong impression in my spirit, you know, that someone came into the service today just with a sense of, um, you know, of loss. That someone maybe in this room, maybe joining us online, you know, just is nursing a wound where you felt like something was unjustly taken away from you where you feel like someone wrongfully took something away from you and you've just been in a place of mourning about that thing that was lost. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a marriage, if it's a relationship, a job, maybe it's a possession. I don't know what it is, but I just feel the sense in my spirit that maybe you're in that place and I trust God today that he will give you a vision of what it feels like to walk with him. That there is no better yesterday than the tomorrows that he has for you. And just in case you're still in that place, just asking, okay, so how do I move forward from this, this thing, this thing that I feel is slowing me down? I pray for you today that you will see the joy of walking with God every day. And to see that your path indeed is shining brighter. Nothing that you have lost can compare to the beauty of the glory of what God has in store for you. Amen. amen. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. How was Valentine's Day? Talk to me. How was Valentine's Day? Talk it, talk it. Say it. How was it? Some people say, ah, well, it was just me and my boo, Jesus. Jesus was my boo. It's okay. Jesus was all our boo. <laughs> Amen. I pray more than ever that the sweet love of the Holy Spirit um, will envelope you, guard your heart and your mind. Regardless of what anyone may have shown on social media to give you tension. Yes? Say, I'm immune to tensioning. I'm immune to tensioning. Uh -huh. The Holy Spirit has inoculated me from tensioning. Amen. Amen and amen. Today, um, we're going further in our series, Enemies of the Heart. Today, we're dealing with the subject, no offense. No offense. But just before we dive right in, I just remember the confessions that we took um, in our sermon last week, talking about how the state of our heart is what determines the results, the fruits, the products that show up in our lives. Do you remember that? Where we said that the sower sows the word. So God is always looking for hearts to sow his word into. He's speaking promises over you. 
He's speaking his good intentions over you. He's declaring the end from the beginning. And your end, according to God's word, is a beautiful, brighter future. He says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God is always sowing seeds of abundance, of beauty, of grace, of goodness concerning you. And just in case the thoughts of the elections are trying to snuff out the joy that is in your spirit, I need you to know today that God is always speaking goodness concerning you. But what determines the quality of the produce, the quality of the fruit that comes out of our lives is the quality of our heart. So we're just going to take these confessions again today and just declare concerning our hearts that this heart this heart that God has given us, it will yield a bountiful fruit of righteousness in Jesus' mighty name. So let's take these confessions again together. Are you ready? Come on, are you ready? Someone isn't sure. Shake something, shake something this morning. Say, I'm ready. ready. Awesome. Say with me, I have a productive heart. Come on, someone say it like you mean it. I need to hear some fighting words in the room this morning. Like you know that you know that these words will produce in your life. Should we do it again? Let's try it one more time. I have a productive heart. My heart is a field that the Lord has blessed. I have the shield of faith around my heart. My heart is safe and kept by the grace of God. My heart is excellent soil for the word of God to be planted. I bring forth my fruit in due season and I bring it forth in multiple folds. My heart is protected against the lust of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. Say again with me, my heart is protected against the heat of persecution and the thief of the planted word. My heart is a factory for divine imagination. It's a factory for godly ideas and for holy conversations. Say with me, I keep my heart strong by feeding diligently and consistently on God's word. I keep my heart cleansed by the washing of the blood and I maintain a pure conscience towards God. Come on, someone, can you put your hands together and celebrate? As you have spoken in God's ears, so shall he do for you. In Jesus' mighty name. But you know, the Bible says we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. We know that we have a full-time enemy who is constantly looking for how to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And to, in order sometimes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, what he tries to do is to, if you can't stop God from sowing the seed into your heart, you're here this morning, you're joining us online, I celebrate that amazing decision you've taken to sow the seed of God's word into your heart. But the enemy knows sometimes that if he cannot stop you from receiving the seed of God's word, he can try to disturb the viability of your heart. And there are just some things that just interfere with the capacity of our hearts to be able to produce good fruit. And one of them is offense, bitterness, anger. Jesus said to his disciples that it is impossible to live in this world without offense. It is the day you wake up in the morning from your house and say, today I will not be angry with someone. That as you step out the door. Is it not right? It is that day that you determine that today I will not quarrel. Today, today, nobody will hear my voice raised. That is the day that someone in your house will remind you that they know where your button is. They know how to press the buttons that determine whether you stay calm, cool, and collected. But I pray for you today that grace, grace will find you in every place that you need it. In the mighty name of Jesus.
And just in case you are struggling with a particular offense from 10 years ago, from two years ago, maybe even yesterday, that you have tried to shake its shackles off of you, but you know that sometimes your reaction is not based on what is happening now. It's from something that happened 20 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And you've been trusting God for grace to move beyond that particular occurrence. I pray for you today that release will be ministered to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. One person in scripture that, you know, we draw strength from is the man called Joseph. Many of us know his story. I'm not going to read his entire story this morning. Time would fail us. But if you start the story from Genesis 37 and read all the way down to Genesis 50, they're just, you know, little snapshots of his life and how his journey went. We know the story. He was the 11th son of the man, Jacob, or Israel. His name was changed to Israel. And the Bible records that his brothers took him one day and sold him to be a slave to the Ishmaelites. We know that his story didn't end there. He got to Egypt. He became a servant, a slave in Potiphar's house. And just when things looked like they were beginning to get good, Potiphar's wife. You see, that eye that is never content with what God has given you, always looking for what is not. God will deliver us. Wicked and unreasonable men, the Bible says. Again, just when things looked like they were getting good, Potiphar's wife set him up, lied against him, maligned. Someone was always trying to steal. Did you notice that? Someone was always trying to steal Joseph's coat, his cloth. Forgive me, our pigeon language, his cloth, right? It sounds. His brothers removed his coat of many colors, dipped it in blood and took it to their father, remember? Then here is Potiphar, Potiphar's wife again, grabbing a hold of his tunic and tearing it off of him. And then fast forward, you see Joseph many, many seasons after. Prime minister in Egypt. Who would have thought it? Who would have even imagined it? Someone who had been wounded, bruised, misused and abused. Finally, prime minister. If it was a Nollywood movie, we would see to God be the glory. That would be the end of the story, right? Yes. It would, have, it would, have, it would be a complete story. But the Bible doesn't end it there. It tells us that not long after there was a famine that... In fact, at that time, there was a famine going on in Egypt and around that region. And his brothers, the very same brothers who were trying to cut short his destiny, came to him bowing down, asking for mercy. And in a classic movie scene, I always read scripture like I'm watching a movie. You know by now, right? So I, I've always imagined it as a Hollywood blockbuster, you know, just setting the stage and seeing, you know, Joseph in his princely attire as the prime minister in Egypt. But for once, I thought to imagine it as a Nollywood movie. You know, it will, it will be sweet. I can imagine who the lead characters would be. Who would be the lead characters? Potiphar would be Kanayo Kanayo, right? <laughs> Forgive me, if you know him, please don't tell him I said that. <laughs> you know what I mean. But here we see Joseph. He's, of course, in Abuja, seat of power. Because it's a Nollywood movie, right? Seat of power, wearing his flowing robes with the red cap on his head. Because, of course, titled man and all of that. And we see the ten brothers filing in and he reveals himself to them finally. The Bible gives us an account in Genesis 50, verse 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? What a response to people who almost snuffed out his life and his destiny. He, at that point, he had, he had the power to do and undo. With one instruction, he could have finished them. And visited on them the same abuse that they had tried to do to him. Because they were trying to kill him the day that they sold him off to be a slave. And nobody would have held him to account because in, that, in those days in Egypt, Pharaoh was, in quotes, was equated with a deity and his prime minister could do and undo. But this was his response to them. Do not be afraid. For am I 
in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. If only we all had capacity to address some of the things that cause us the highest pain, the most torment when we think about them from our past. If only we ourselves had the capacity to look at those things in the eye and tell them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. And then he begins to assure them, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. You know, we read some scriptures sometimes and it feels like they were robots doing these things. He makes it look so easy, right? He, see how the words were just falling. I will provide for you. I'll provide from your, for your little ones. People that wanted to kill him that took him forcefully from his father's house and sold him to a strange land. If that incident had not occurred, maybe Joseph would have thought, I wouldn't have had to endure all those Potiphar and Potiphar's wife issues. I wouldn't have had to spend time in the prison. But that was not Joseph's preoccupation. Joseph was able to somehow... Look past all of that, the wickedness, the hate, the bad intentions, and see that God had a hand in this. And because God has done this and preserved me, I won't only look after you. I will even look after your children coming after you. I mean, how, how do you beat that? How do you have a heart like that? You know, when I read scriptures like this and I, and I begin to imagine myself in those scriptures, surrounding those things with the everyday occurrences of my life, the things I go through day by day, and the places where I too find it difficult to forgive sometimes. I ask the question, God, what was it that you did in the life of Joseph? Can you do that in me? Is there an honest person in the room today who is saying, Father, can you do that same work in me? Because sometimes I want to let go. Sometimes I am willing to release this person, this offense, this, this, past, this, this past hurt. But when the thought of what happened just flies over my head, it's as if my mood is sunk for the day. So there's a willingness. I want to do it. But sometimes in the execution, I'm stuck. Is there an honest person in the room who is saying, Lord, give me grace? Give me grace for a heart like Joseph's heart. Because I can assure you that Joseph's testimony and the fullness of what God wanted to do with Joseph, you know, it was made beautiful when he became a prime minister. That, that is a testimony on its own. But the real fulfillment of God's plan was that he was able to provide a posterity for God's people. If he had made it to that prime minister seat without dealing with the offense in his heart, how many of us know that that is what deposes kings? Remember the man Saul. It's one thing to make it to that seat of power and that position of grace that God has called you to. How you sustain it and maintain it and steward it right is the quality of your heart. Can you tell someone sitting beside you, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. If that person doesn't look like they're hearing you, turn to the other person. Because it is critical that you preach this message this morning. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Because you see, what determines the reward, the results, the fullness of the brightness that you will see manifest in your life. The Bible says it's, it's about the heart. The issues of life, they spring out of the heart. So it is critical in this season that we keep our hearts clean. We keep our hearts preserved and protected. And we maintain a heart that can bring forth the kind of results that God wants us to produce. I pray concerning you that God will give you grace and capacity for everything that you need to do to keep your heart healthy in Jesus mighty name Amen. I suspect that if we had the opportunity to sit Joseph down and ask him Joseph what was it what was it that made you this kind of person that could release your brothers freely 
I'd not insist on visiting them with the same evil that they visited on you. I suspect that maybe he may have a few tips for us this morning. And this, this, this conversation that we're about to have may be something similar to what he would say to us as well in the room. Offenses will surely come. Jesus said it. If Jesus said it, you can expect it. There will be offense. People will always try to steal your peace, steal your joy. Steal. Even saying good morning sometimes has offended some people. So there will be offense in this life. But the Bible says, expect it. But, but even as you expect the offense, there is a state of heart you can have where the offenses will not slow you down. They will not be the determinant of whether or not you attain to what God has for you. Amen. Amen. So this morning, the question is how? How do we keep our hearts free from offenses? How do we maintain and sustain or maybe even attain the kind of heart that can receive what God has for us in this season and not waste the grace that God has poured out? Amen. The first thing we need to know this morning is how to keep our hearts free from offense. Number one is the power of clarifications. Communication. We're together this morning. The power of communication and confrontations. You know, sometimes as believers, right, people of God, Christians, we think that the Christianly thing to do when we're offended about a matter is just to go, bless you, forget about it. Right? We think that is the holy thing to do. But it's, you know, there is something inside that is telling you it's not quite right. The Bible doesn't just say that you should forgive. In fact, the Bible says that if you come before the altar with an offering and you remember that there is a brother or a sister that you are offended, or who is offended with you rather, he said, drop the offering. Don't bother to give me the offering. Keep the offering aside. Go and settle. The Bible is saying to us that there is need for us to be willing to engage positively with one another. I think the challenge we have sometimes is because we think that in confronting someone or in communicating, you know, a grievance to people, we think maybe it has to be a full-on, you know, shouting match. It doesn't have to be. We can disagree without being disagreeable. I can express my feelings to you without necessarily wanting to tear you down and cut you down and using hateful words to destroy your self-esteem. And for some of us, that is a real battle this morning because the way we have learned how to, in quote, disagree is unhealthy. And God has to give you grace to learn how to disagree with grace. The Bible says speak the truth to each other in love. I'll never forget many years ago, I was um, an entry-level staff in an organization and I'd gone for this training, Right? And at the training, you know how they bring all these, you know, gurus to come and talk to you about, you know, dress the way you need to be, you want to be addressed. And how you step into a room, you have to command attention and immediately you greet people. Stretch out your hand and greet everybody. And I was so high on that conversation that day, feeling like the next big sensation in corporate Nigeria. I went to midweek service in my church back there and... I remember at the end of the service, I saw these three elderly men just standing and having a conversation together. I still remembering that, hey, dress the way you should be addressed and blah, 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 and perspire and aspire and all of those things. I rushed up to them and I went to greet them. Good evening, sir. You know, shook their hands, feeling like the next best thing in corporate Nigeria. And I mean, to be fair, they were very gracious to me that evening. I could see the look of surprise on their faces. They shook my hand quite all right, and they answered me, and I walked away, you know, strutting, feeling like, you know, little miss everything, you know. One of them, I'll never forget him, gracious, kind, he was a Christian. The next Sunday, he calls me aside and says, you know, Bola, you remember on Wednesday when you came to greet us? I was like, oh, yes, sir, I saw you, and I said, yeah, very good, it's okay. You know, when you learn some of these things, you need to mix it with context. The person who came to 
perspire to aspire you in the office in the morning, did not explain to you that you are in Lagos, Nigeria. And when you're greeting a group of three elderly people in Lagos, Nigeria, it is not the right thing to do to stretch out your hand. How many of us know that it is considered disrespect? Here I was, I was oblivious to the fact that I had caused offense. But in grace, this man chose to just pull me aside and say, hmm, this girl, don't go and do it in the wrong environment where they will not understand. He said, he said, I know you. I know you did not mean to cause offense. That's why I'm telling you so you will not do it again. You know, that day I left feeling very humbled, my tail between my legs. <laughs> you know? But thank you. After, after a while, stopping back to reflect on it, I was grateful for elders like that in the church who don't immediately assume concerning you because they've seen you exhibit some behavior that they are wondering about. Because he could very easily have decided, oh, this rude girl, I don't even want to talk to her. Right? He could have easily done that. But thank God for maturity and grace. He called me aside, explained to me, you need to contextualize these things and you need to comport yourself a little better. You know, there are people that we are offended at, that don't even know that we are offended. You are packing face. Forgive me if you are not in Lagos, Nigeria. Packing face means that you are angry and you're, not, you're refusing to be gracious to them with people who don't even know what it is that you are angry about. I was in a forum with some women one day and we were having a conversation about, you know, just dealing with anger and offense and when people are angry at you. And this lady says, you know, she remembers that there was this person who had, she just noticed that the relationship just broke down. She didn't know why. She didn't know what caused it. She didn't even know what she did to cause this person to pull away. But she noticed that there was some distance in the relationship. And every time she tried to be her normal, friendly self, the person, you know, you, you know now, body language, you know how it is. When we, uh, women, you know, answer me, you know. <laughs> you know, you're trying to greet someone, you're trying to be nice, and then you can see that the person is being unnecessarily stiff. Especially if they were different before that. She said she had tried, you know, <laughs> tried, you know, thinking, okay, maybe that one was an off day. Tried again, tried a few times, but the attitude was not changing. And she, she took it to God in prayer and said, God, I don't understand what is going on, but because your scripture says, if anybody is offended at me, I can't ignore it. What should I do? God, she said, she was hoping. She said, honestly, she was hoping that the Holy Spirit said, hey, if they're ignoring you, you to ignore them now. Is your umbilical cord tied together? She was really hoping that that would be the release that the Holy Spirit would give her, but she said, nope. He told her, just keep, keep doing what you are doing. Huh. Keep doing what you are doing. And she says, in the fullness of time, this same person eventually comes back to apologize and tell me what the reason for the offense was. Someone told me that you said this and this about me, and that was the reason why I decided to cut off. And by the time they actually had a conversation about it, the person realized that, look, but the truth is when I saw that you continued to just be kind, you continued to just greet me, even though I know my attitude was bad, something began to tell me that, are you not foolish? How can what this person said to you be true if she's behaving herself with such grace? What am I asking for this morning? We need to be willing to have a sit down, call your brother, call your sister and say, let's talk about this. It's okay sometimes to call your husband, call your wife and say, look, you offended me. I feel offended about this. The problem is not in pointing out the fact that we have disagreements. The problem is how we point out those disagreements sometimes. There's one kind of personality, you know, who is always voicing their disagreements. You know those people that we have labeled? That person in your office, who's small thing, they've already reacted. You know them. Does anyone have someone like that in your office? Someone who is always angry about something. Show me, do you have someone like that in your office? Because if I don't see your hand up, I will begin to suspect you that maybe you are the one. Maybe you are the one in that office that is always offended about everything, about something all of the time. And it's easy sometimes to label those people and give them a name. But I just want to point out this morning that the person who swallows the offense and is still burning inside is also equally, equally not excused from this matter. 
God wants to help us so that these hurts and these offenses and this bitterness do not slow us down from what he has prepared for us. We see from Joseph's story that everything in his future pointed to greatness. Everything in his future pointed to, you know, elevation and, and people bowing down. Just the same way in 2023, God has given us a word, unusual elevation. But what will determine if you will lay hold of that unusual elevation is the quality of the heart. Can you just tell yourself this morning, I choose to keep a productive heart. No offense will slow me down in 2023. Bitterness will not take root inside of me. I choose to travel light. And so shall it be for you in Jesus' mighty name. One of the most dangerous assumptions we can make is to believe that we know why someone did something without the benefit of conversation, reflection, and confrontation. We need to be willing. We need to be willing. We need to push ourselves sometimes and be willing to just sit down with that person and ask the question, how can we address this matter? I've learned personally that I thought I was born again. <clears throat> Spirit-filled, tongue-talking, demon-binding, chain-breaking. I thought I was a daughter of God until I got married. And then I had to redefine my salvation all over again. How many of us know that the marriage relationship will try and test your capacity to love and to forgive? How many of us know that? So if you're not married in the room, I put it to you, this is the best time for you to work that forgiveness muscle. Right? Your friend, your sister, your brother offends you and you've cut them off immediately. I cut them off. I cut them off. I cut them off. You cut everybody off. Where? You get what I mean. The first few times we had disagreements in my marriage, I had to look at myself a few times and ask, ah, Bola, is it still you? But I had to learn how to disagree with grace. It's not a bad thing that you have things to disagree about with your spouse. You are not the devil and neither is your spouse the devil. There will always be things to disagree about. It's how we choose to disagree with them. And the perspective we keep to those issues. See Joseph, you sold me, but God sent me. There's a way you can reposition that offense where you are able to be constructive about it. We got married, my husband and I, and two completely different ideologies and dispensations. We fought about everything, by the way, just in case you look at PG or you look at me and you think that, oh, these people, oh, I'm sure water does not uh, fall from their mouth. They look very holy. <laughs> hey, I kid you not, we fought about everything until we allowed the Holy Spirit to reset our brains. This one occasion I remember. We had both gone to work in the morning, and for some reason, I don't remember why or how, I came home earlier than him that day, because my office was fairly far away, so he usually would get home before me. I come home from work on this day, and lo and behold, I try to put the key in the lock, and the door is open. Hey, since morning, to this time, in Lagos, hey, <laughs> I thought I was going to give him the words he had never heard from the beginning of his life to that time. People are saying, ah, you're doing that to our pastor. Eh, he's my husband. He's my husband. Yeah, he's my husband. It's okay. <laughs> I thought I was going to tell him words that he had never heard from the beginning of his life to that day. I was just angry. Before he even came, I was one stoking the anger on my inside. You know, even when I want to calm it down, no, 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 no. But like, don't you understand what just happened? You need to show him that you don't do like this in Lagos. <laughs> Say, God will help us. God will reset us in Jesus' mighty name. Fighting over things that we can sit down and have a proper conversation about. I didn't begin to gain understanding until I chose to begin to analyze his background and mine. I grew up in a house, father, mother, four children. In fact, my father was a soldier. So if you don't lock the house, he will lock it. In fact, he will go back and check like three times to make sure he will do round he would do security watch. He would check at midnight, make sure that, you get what I mean? That was the father I had. And I was now projecting that on this young man 
Who grew up in a home with how many wives? Like three or four, different times, different, and the three were not constant. They were changing here and there. Children almost 24, 25. If you lock the door, you're going to sleep. You don't know if son number three or four is still outside, enjoying his life. And he comes in the morning and says, who locked me out? It's you. I will show you today. That was how he grew up. Now I could have wasted my time carrying that anger and just massaging it to my chest and not allowing myself to breathe, not allowing him to breathe. Or I could have understood that, look, okay, we're coming from two different places. How do we meet each other in the middle? And some of us were exhausted from the fighting, exhausted from the quarreling, exhausted from the constant bickering. And all God is asking us to do is to sit down and confront the issue in love. Will you let God help you this week? Rather than exhausting yourself and wearying yourself, trying to fight battles that you have no business engaging, will you allow him to give you grace to gain perspective about the matter? Amen. 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 I pray that you will see grace in the coming week. What took me 10 years will not take you 10 years. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Your heart is as important as the offering you bring to God. So I want you to steward that heart well. I want you to steward that heart well. Not every offense, every lie, every hurt deserves to take up room. Your heart is expensive real estate. Do you get what I'm saying? Your heart is expensive real estate because it produces the issues of your life. How do you rent out space in your heart to every garbage heap and garbage dump that wants to come and just offload on you? Say, no, not, not me, not me, not me. Let things that bring forth joy, bring forth peace, bring forth healthy imaginations that can birth the next dimension of witty inventions. Those are the things that you need to incubate on. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Whatsoever things be pure. If there's good report there, that is what should dwell in your heart. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So the power of clarification, communication, and confrontation. The second thing I want us to know today, you know how to keep our hearts free from offense, is the power of forgiveness and healing. Ah, forgiveness is a catalyst for healing. I think it was in maybe like the seventh, maybe sixth or seventh year in my marriage. I don't remember exactly what year it was right now. But I remember this day going to work one morning and just feeling angry about something. It may have been some irrelevant thing. You get what I'm saying? Ah, I've grown. This, this daughter of Jehovah, I've grown. Just being angry about something and just ranting on my way to work. You know, God, I can't take this anymore. This, I know I promised you I was, going to, I was going to represent you well in this marriage. But I'm just tired. And I was just going off. Blah, 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 blah. Just talking. And it felt like the Holy Spirit. <laughs> someone, someone, uh, you understand, right? You understand. Ah, you see, ah, they are born again Christians here. Yeah, honest people. And it felt in a moment like the Holy Spirit just froze time and said, I hear you. I'm hearing you. As you are speaking, I'm hearing you. You say you are tired of it, Abby. You are tired. Okay. But what are you willing to do to change this thing that you are tired of? Hey. You know when Jesus gives you a, a jump, jump question? And you are wondering, where is the answer to this question? I'm not seeing the options in A, B, C. Ha. Huh. How do I want to change it? But I, I just finished complaining about your son. I just complained about him. You're asking me what I want to do about it. I thought you would come and say, verily, verily, I say unto you, my daughter, it's true, I need to change God, man, so that he will stop disturbing you. No, he said, you, you, what are you willing to do about it? And for the first time, God confronted me with the foolishness of my assumptions. He said, I hear you. I hear you say that you're tired of it. But if you want a new marriage, you have to go home and treat your husband like he has never offended you before. Hey, me, with my full dossier 
offended me first in, in, on 2nd February 2011, documented. Next offense, 1st of May 2012, documented. I had my dossier sharp in my head, and you are saying I should wipe the entire slate clean. So that the next time he tries to confront me with something stupid I've done, I won't be able to say, hey, you two, see what you two did. You understand me. Stop, stop for me. We understand each other. You know what I'm saying. You mean I won't have anything to answer with when he confronts me with my own foolishness? Huh. <sighs> You see, it's good to be honest with the Holy Spirit because he asked me that question. He said, are you willing to go home and treat him like he has never offended you before? <sighs> I said, I want to. Please help me. Because I'd been that way for the first 20-something years of my life. And while I was receiving grace from the Holy Spirit to walk more perfectly with him, I knew that I still had proclivities. I knew that I still had tendencies that the Holy Spirit had to help me wash out of my system. I said, if you will help me. And I'm so happy to say to you this morning, in front of the people of God, 20 years married by December this year, God has given us grace to behave like Christians. See, there was some healing that could not happen in that marriage until we were both willing to forgive and allow the healing to come. So that's what I'm saying to someone this morning. There's a dimension of healing. I'm talking about the healing of a marriage, but there are even physical healings that are dependent on your capacity to let go of certain offenses. It's the um, Miss, um, brother Kenneth E. Hagen that told the story about a woman who came to him on the healing line. She wanted healing in her body for some ailment. And God showed him in a flash in the spirit that, look, there's an offense that you are holding on to, some bitterness. That is what is holding you back from receiving your healing. I don't remember now if it was healing from cancer or some other thing. And the doctors tell us now that even medical science says that there are some illnesses that cannot be traced to any physical pathogen, but psychosomatic issues. That means issues that you cannot touch, feel, see, but they are happening on your inside, in your heart and in your mind. So I'm asking you, by the mercies of God today, embrace forgiveness so that you may be healed. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another so that you may be, come on someone, so that you may be, come on someone, shout it loud, even if you're not there yet, but you're trusting God for grace, so that you may be, healed hallelujah and i pray that the healing power of god will reach right where you are he will give you grace to let go of that offense regardless of how deep it went regardless of how far reaching it went someone may be saying look the very people who were meant to move me far in life are the ones who did me this evil and i hear you i said earlier that sometimes you're angry at people who don't know you're angry at them Sometimes you are angry at people who meaningfully and willfully committed that evil. And you are left in a place where you are just hurt by the fact that this person is not even remorseful by, you know, about what they did. About how they offended you. About how they broke your trust. And I declare over you today that God will help you. God will help you to move beyond that place. Because you cannot stay shackled to that particular incident. You cannot stay shackled to that occurrence in your life. It's time this morning to say, you know what? That may have happened. But that is not the best of my life. The best of God is always in the future. It's never in the past. And just in case you think that someone stole the best of you, you don't understand this Jesus that you are calling to. The best of Jesus is never in the past. Whatever it was, it may have been a relationship. It may have been a house. It may have been a contract. It may even have been a business deal. Did someone lie about you and because of that you lost out on a lucrative business that you had gone in for? Believe me, if you believe, you will see the goodness of God. And if you would choose to allow the grace and goodness of God to wash you clean and free you from the hurt of that offense, what God has in store for you is far greater than what you may have let go of in the past. 
Can someone say amen? Amen. 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 So number two today, forgiveness. Forgiveness. The power of forgiveness and healing. Those who live in the hope of resurrection must stay light and offense free. Hallelujah. You know, along with this conversation is just resisting the urge. When you have the, when it's now in your power to hurt someone who has offended you, you know. It's one thing for someone to offend you, but they're there. Sometimes you go on Facebook or Instagram, you see them, they don't look like the demons of hell are chasing them and it makes you angry. After all, they offended you. They should, they should be living a life that shows that. It's one thing to see all of that and try to steward your heart. It's another thing when someone has offended you and it is in your power to do damage to them as well. That's a whole other level. And if you do not deal with that, with that offense and that unforgiveness, you may find yourself in the same place that the man called Haman. How many of us know the story? Haman in the book of Esther. Ah. You know, there are stories I read in scripture and they fill me with holy fear. Because when you think about it, Haman was just this guy in government. Yes, he was, you know, an accomplished warrior. The king loved him. But the only thing that tripped him off was his hate for Mordecai. Finish. How does your hatred for one guy finish your entire career, finish your entire marriage, finish the entire life? As in this man was hung on the same gallows that he built for Mordecai. And what was it exactly that Mordecai did that he had to go and build gallows? As in, your robbers will say, kill her, kill her. As in, really, I, I mean, I understand that respect is a big deal. Mordecai refused to, you get, rababa for him, right? I understand. But really, was it that significant to plan the entire annihilation of a whole tribe because of one man's offense? See, see, that unforgiveness is a slippery slope. And if you do not choose to deliver yourself, ah, I pray for you. I pray for you. Haman's future will not be yours. You will receive the grace of the Holy Spirit to steward your heart. Even when there is a wrong that has been done to you, I pray for you that God will give you grace to release it and to let it go in the name of Jesus. The third tool I need you to take note of today in this conversation is the power of growth and learning. <laughs> you know, when the Bible says in Galatians 5 that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, and all of those, he said, against such, there is no law. The reason why the Bible recommends to you growth, maturity, allowing the fruit of the Spirit to be birthed in you and to flourish out of you is because it is, an, it is a defense for you. It's a defense for you. Someone may come and say, look, everybody's always finding my trouble. Everybody is always looking for my trouble. Um, um, uh, you fight with the gate man. You fight with the driver. You fight with the maid. You fight with spouse. You fight with friends. Everybody is always looking for your trouble. Why is it your trouble that is easy to find? There is a level of grace and maturity that allows you to just walk over things that were supposed to trip you off. Have you seen them at the bus stop before? Two people just fighting. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? If I, my brother is the kinikon, kinikon, my, if, I, if I tell you who I am and they're fighting and you're asking yourself the question, do I know who I am? And this is your level. <laughs> Christian maturity is calling, calling that grace from you. Where not everything is a cause for you to stop and lose your salvation. If someone not greeting you five years ago was enough to make you feel like, you know, it shouldn't still be the case for you now. Can you tell the person beside you, grow up, 
grow up, grow up, grow up. There's a place, there's a place in maturity and learning to just, and just see yourself in the light of God's word, knowing that there is a glorious destiny ahead of you and you cannot allow yourself to be trapped by this level. It, it demands that you are spiritual to that next level. You can't be bothered by these little issues anymore. There's a minister in church. Don't worry, look straight. They won't know I'm talking about you. Minister in church, he told me once that, um, you know, he was building, building a house, right? And in the course of building that new house, lots of projects going on at work. Very, it was just a busy season for him. And something happened, some offense came up and I think he said at the time that it was a kind of case that you could actually seek lawyers and begin to address it in court. It was that serious, right? Someone, someone caused something, an offense, and he could very easily have begun to contact lawyers and say, oh yeah, we're going to deal with this matter. You're going to understand that you don't treat people like this. But he said in a flash, the Spirit of God just ministered to him. Forget about it. It's a distraction. It's a distraction. You know, sometimes we get so busy chasing little things that we lose sight of the bigger things that God has for us. That's what offense does. You are chasing these little, little, little issues. Someone did not greet you the way you wanted to be greeted. Someone did not say things the way you wanted them to say it. They served you bread instead of yam, and because of that, the entire house must cave in. You know, there's a degree of maturity that comes upon you, that you lose, you lose your capacity for these little things. You're pushing, pressing forward to the higher calling in Christ. Can you say that to your neighbor one more time? Grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up. Hallelujah. So how, how to ensure, how to ensure that we maintain a heart that is free from offense? Grow up. And my prayer for you today is that you receive grace from God. In Jesus' mighty name. For a moment, can I invite you to just bow your head? I'm not unmindful of the fact right now that there may be people in the room who are dealing with, dealing with an offense that has weighed them down for long. And I can just give you my own personal, this is my own personal pathway. When I'm dealing with an offense and I've brought it to God and say, God, I need you to help me because this one, this one, it, it hit me in my in my inner, inner, you know what I mean, inner. There's an offense that you can just brush off like this, but sometimes people wound you inside and you're dealing with real, a real burden. I've learned to pray for them. I've learned to pray for them. So I'm inviting you this morning, if you're dealing with an offense, maybe a parent that should have done what they didn't do, or a sister or a brother who, or who, who, who just caused you untold damage, someone wrecked your reputation, someone tried to steal something that was precious to you, but if not for the grace of God, I want you to just lift up your voice and just begin to ask, receive from God grace, grace to let it go, grace to forgive, grace to drop that weight. The Bible says, lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets you. You can't run fast if you're carrying dumbbells in your pocket. Say, God, I receive grace from you to lay it down. I may not know how, but pastor prayed, if you will help me, yes. So I can receive that same grace for you. Lift up your voice and say, God, help me, help me, help me, help me. I know I'm your child, but sometimes I still struggle with forgiving that person. Help me. In Jesus' name. Now, second prayer point. You may be in this room and you said that prayer, but still... Still, you know that that wound, and this morning I don't pretend to know the depth of some of the things that we've gone through. Someone may have been through a rape. Someone may have been through some really traumatic experiences. And even as I say, pray that prayer to receive grace from God to help, you're still wondering, how will I do it? This is how I, this is how I fight that battle. I begin to pray for them. Yes, that person who did that. Yes, yes, that person who wounded you, I begin to pray for them. And not those kind of fire prayers that we like to pray. The thunder that is coming from heaven is still doing press up and it will find them and locate them in Jesus. Not that prayer. You're going to pray God bless them. God heal them from whatever it was that made them this way. Bless.
bless the work of their hands. Let their tomorrow be brighter than their yesterday. You are praying for them. Father, you will bless them. Bless their business. Cause them to prosper any which way they turn. Bless their children. The chi their children's children are blessed after them. See, if that wound is deep, the way I know for some people it is deep, you will cry when you're praying that prayer. Because emotional blood is flowing. It's an emotional wound and blood is flowing. I understand. I've been there. I've cried those tears. But the promise I can give you is that it won't always be this way. If you will stay consistent with this. You pray for them today. You pray for them tomorrow. Every prayer that you pray for yourself, you pray for them. And the first few times you do it, it may feel like an open sore on your inside that is not healing. Stay with it. You stay with it in faith. The day you know that you have crossed to the other side, like Moses and the children of Israel crossing that Red Sea, is the day you come to pray for them and the words just flow. The blood doesn't flow anymore. You're praying for them and your heart is light and you are blessing them from your inside and innermost parts. And then you will know that you are ready for your next level. Because the Bible says that new wine belongs in new wine skins. This is a process for turning that old wine skin of bitterness and anger into a new wine skin that God can fill with new wine. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone in this room who is asking you, Father, I have the to will to forgive, but I'm trusting you for the grace to execute. Father, give them the to do. Because your word says you work it in us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Someone receives the to do. Someone receives the to do. What they could not do in their own strength, they receive it from you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And just in case you're in the room, and you've never said that prayer, giving your life to Jesus. We don't like to close a service without giving someone an opportunity to give their lives to Jesus. If you're watching us online, member of our online church, I just want to extend this invitation to you as well. You may have said this prayer at some point in your life, but you know right now that you're living a life that does not represent God well. And you know you need to rededicate your life to God. While the heads are still bowed, can I invite you? If you've never said a prayer giving your life to Jesus, or maybe you said it in the past, but you know you need to say it again, to say, Jesus, Jesus, help me to live a life that honors you. Can I ask that you lift up your hand? Right where you're sitting, lift up your hand and lift it up high. There's something I love about lifting up our hands. It's a prophetic declaration. You're lifting your hands to the heaven and you're just like a child lifts up their hands to their father. And the father or the mother has no option than to lift up that child. I believe it's a prophetic act where you're saying, God, you're lifting me. You will lift me. What I can't do in my strength, you will lift me. What I can't do in my own power, you will lift me. What I cannot claim in my own capacity, you will lift me. If your hand is lifted, I want to ask you to take one more step of faith. Please rise up on your feet. Please rise up on your feet. I want to pray with you. And there's someone sitting beside you who wants to identify you and put something in your hand that will help you to stand as a child of God. If you're standing in the room today, or if you're watching us online and you're saying this prayer, giving your life to Jesus, please go ahead and put it in the chat room. I am giving my life to Jesus. Put it in the comments, put it in the chat. There's someone there who wants to give you some gift to help you on your journey of standing as a believer. If you're saying this prayer with me today, please, let's pray together. Say, dear God, I thank you for your generous heart. I thank you because you're a God who loves and loves indeed. I thank you because your generous heart has made room for me to come to you today. So God, I respond to the generosity of your love by saying, please forgive me. Forgive me of every sin that has caused a separation between us. I ask today, Lord, that you wash me clean in the blood of Jesus. 
I ask my father that you make me your child. Help me to stand for you and to represent you well. Thank you for your forgiveness. I am now a child of God. Hallelujah. We bless you, God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. If you said that prayer with me, oh, I honor you. I celebrate you. I'm so excited for you because that's the best decision I ever made. Best, hands down, best decision I ever made. Giving my life to Jesus. And I'm, I'm so happy for you that you've chosen to embrace the love of God in this way. Our counselors are sitting around the room. They want to pull you aside, explain to you just the tools that we have here as a church that can help you stabilize and grow stronger in your faith. Amen. Once again, can I ask you to celebrate everyone who has given their lives to Christ today? Heaven celebrates them. Heaven is ecstatic right now. And we ought to be that way as well. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Um, and just before.